Hi, my name is Pada Dube and I'm one of the employment law solicitors here at Dockland Solicitors in Canary Wharf. One of the key aims of this video is not only to just introduce ourselves, but to also advise you that we are here to support you with all your employment law needs and matters that may arise. This could be on the basis of the fact that you're an employer who requires advice and assistance, or alternatively, you are an employer who needs a settlement agreement to be progressed accordingly to your benefit and to the benefit of your prospective departing employee. As part of a process of ourselves getting to know you and yourselves getting to know us, one of the key things that we'll be doing is over the next series of months putting together a few set of webinars that will assist you and also provide you with the opportunity to contact us if such situations arise. One of the key topics I'll be looking at as a first step is effectively that of settlement agreements. Settlement agreements are becoming more and more common and are seen as the most amicable way of bringing the employer and employee relationship to an agreeable end. This can prove very beneficial for both the employer and the employee themselves. Throughout the following slides, we'll look at the key issues regarding settlement agreements, notably what a settlement agreement actually is, the legal formalities needed to ensure that this is a binding document, the role of the legal advisor throughout the process and negotiation, what without prejudice communications actually are, the tax implications, as well as just some general key clauses which might make understanding a settlement agreement you're presented with easier to understand. An employer may occasionally consider using settlement agreements to terminate an employee's employment as an alternative to having to go through time-consuming formal internal processes such as your disciplinary procedure, performance management or indeed even a redundancy procedure to which that employee is subject to. Settlement agreements might also arise in circumstances where the employee has put forward serious grievances that may actually result in a formal claim. Where circumstances are such that a claim has already been lodged against the employer, a settlement agreement is never off the table. Litigation can always be quite costly and risky in terms of potential outcomes and can also bring negative publicity for both parties being the employer and the employee themselves. Now let's look at what a settlement agreement actually is. A settlement agreement is a formal legal binding document made between an employer and their employee, or indeed a former employee, in which the employee or former employee agrees not to pursue any particular claims that they believe are in relation to their employment, or indeed its termination. For this agreement, the employee or former employee will receive a financial payment in return. Such an agreement effectively allows both parties to end the employment relationship on agreed terms. A model settlement agreement can be located on the ACAS website and a link to this has been attached on this slide as reference. Regardless of what draft or model settlement agreement you receive, there is always a need for it to be tailored to suit the needs and the circumstances that have resulted in effectively a settlement agreement being proposed and subsequently agreed. Now let's take a look at the legal formalities that allow for any settlement agreement to be legally binding. In relation to statutory employment rights, in order for a settlement agreement to be legally binding, the following important conditions must be fulfilled. The settlement agreement itself must be in writing. It must relate to particular proceedings. The employee must have received independent legal advice from an advisor as to the terms and to the effect of the proposed agreement, mainly in relation to the employee's ability to then pursue any such proceedings before an employment tribunal. The independent advisor needs to ensure that there is a current contract of insurance or professional indemnity insurance that covers the risk of a claim by the employee in respect of a loss arising from their advice. Further to that, the agreement must identify the relevant advisor by name and establishment. The agreement must state also the applicable statutory conditions relating to settlement agreements under the relevant act or acts that have been satisfied. 
For the purposes of clarity, the people who are eligible as relevant advisors are qualified lawyers, these being solicitors holding practicing certificates or barristers in practice or effectively those employed to give legal advice. Officers, officials, employees or members of any independent trade union provided that they have been certified in writing by the union as being competent and authorised to give advice. Employees or volunteer workers at advice centres such as the CAB for example giving free legal advice provided that they have been certified in writing by the advice centre as competent and authorised to give advice. Fellows of Institute and Legal Executives employed by solicitors' practices. Now let's take a look at Without Prejudice Communications. There are many advantages of settling disputes, however not every form of negotiation will always result in a positive outcome. In those types of circumstances, the employee, and indeed the employer, may seek to avoid the tribunal, a court, or indeed the public becoming aware of these settlement negotiations, mainly because such negotiations may give the impression effectively that either party or both parties had very little confidence in their own positions. This is where effectively the concept of without prejudice has developed. The key aspects and the essential ones that result in without prejudice communication are the statements made must be a genuine attempt at settling the dispute itself. Statements may not be brought before a tribunal or court as evidence. It's always highly advisable to write without prejudice for the sake of clarity and the avoidance of confusion. There is a requirement for an active dispute. Just because there's also a grievance doesn't particularly mean that there is a live dispute to which without prejudice communications may apply. An ambiguous impropriety may break without prejudice communication. So for example, threatening the other party or the use of discriminatory language. The negotiation process. It's usually the employer or their solicitors who will produce the draft settlement agreement first. However, there's no point in going through to the time and the expense of having an agreement drafted if there isn't at least a principal agreement that has been reached with the employee. Once this is done, the employee will then be requested to take independent legal advice on the terms of that agreement. There's generally a period of going back and forth and ensuring effectively that both parties are happy with the final product. Once agreed, two copies are then produced for signature. Once the copies have been signed by both parties, the agreement becomes legally binding. Each party keeps one signed copy. Throughout the process, up until both parties have signed the agreement, the agreement is always referred to as subject to contract. Now let's consider taxation on termination payments. Employers often wrongly believe that all payments made on termination of employment are subject to a tax exemption of £30,000. However, not all sums payable under a settlement agreement are subject to this rule. In determining what tax is payable in respect of termination payments, the key is to identify each element of the termination package and then consider the tax provisions applicable to each individual element. Outstanding wages, bonuses, commission and holiday pay are all taxable payments under the employee's contract of employment. The ex gratia sums paid as compensation for loss of employment are subject to the £30,000 tax-free exemption. This includes statutory and contractual redundancy payments, provided there is a genuine redundancy to be accounted for, but this is unlikely to include early retirement payments. On such ex gratia payments, tax must be paid beyond the £30,000 mark, but they are completely exempt from national insurance contributions. If in doubt, employers should always seek specific advice on tax treatment for the various payments being made under a settlement agreement and should always include a tax indemnity for the employee in disagreement. In addition to the settlement of the employment dispute, 
Here are some other common clauses that you will find within a settlement agreement. An agreement by both parties to keep the details of the settlement confidential and not to make any detrimental statements about one another. A requirement that the employee is to return employer's property and this includes intellectual property itself. The provision of an agreed form of reference for the employee. A tax indemnity from the employee as we've discussed in the earlier slide. Post-termination restrictions. Now where restrictive covenants apply, comparisons should always be made with the employee's contract of employment. Any discrepancies need to be clarified and confirmed accordingly. Some of these clauses will be requested by the employee's legal advisor during the course of negotiation, and as such, as an employer, it is key not to give away too much in the early stages. As an employer, the key aspect is to remember that not only are you catering for your own legal expenses, but you will be responsible for a contribution to the employee's legal expenses as well. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to the webinar. I hope it has been beneficial and if any queries, any questions do arise, then please do not hesitate to contact me on the details that will be coming across the screen. The next webinar will be that of disciplinary hearings and grievance hearings and conducting those in a fair manner. This is due to be released in the middle of December. Thank you very much.